morning, everybody. Um, we are starting here with our fourth plenary session. So please come in, all of you who are still in the door, around the door, near the door. Um, the title of this session is The Institutional Change Exchange Market Law, Policies, Education and Religion. Um, and we've got a particularly strong panel this morning, uh, which I am uh, honored to chair. Uh, the keynote address, today's keynote address, this morning's keynote address, I should say, is delivered by Professor Dr. Jane Banner from the University of Cape Town. She's a prolific writer and one of the most well-known gender and sexuality specialists in the academic field and also in the activist field uh, in Southern Africa, but particularly, of course, in South Africa. Um, just to mention her latest book, Jacketed Women, which came out this year on gender and sexuality in the South African context. Um, she's going to talk to us about some nice beginning the institutional seduction and politics of sexuality and gender, of course related to her book, in contemporary Southern African context. Um, Jane, the floor is yours. Thank you, Saskia. Buenos días a todos. Puedo dar mis felicitaciones al Instituto de Gino Giovanni y um, gracias por su hospitalidad, gracias por Mario Pecheni y su equipo fantástico. And you will be very glad to hear that I'm going to give the rest of my presentation in English. <laughs> Thank you for, for being here early in the morning. And I'm going to return to the opening slide and try to explain what, what I mean by that title. But I'm hoping before I even do that to begin with showing you a YouTube video. I'm hoping the sound will, will work. Uploaded um, about three months ago in cyberspace. And is entitled Gay Zulu Wedding. Sorry, we'll have to go through the end. to be a small town KZN wedding of a very different kind. Same-sex marriages may no longer be a big deal in the cities, but in this small rural area, 27-year-old Toba Sitole is breaking brave new ground. Honestly speaking, I was expecting a lot of negativity because we come from the, from the KZN that um, homosexuality is something that we've adapted from the Western countries. They, they haven't accepted it due to lack of knowledge, which is one thing I know. And if we're in case that normally we hide ourselves because of the talent we have and who His significant other since 2011, Cameron Mudesane, is still in Johannesburg. He says there have been critics, but they're going ahead anyway. Being slotted out and, and a bull, just to, just, just as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a way to to ask for blessings from our ancestors and for them to bless our marriage and, and going forward, we call them Amatosi. 
if you like. And also, the whole ceremony is more about what we were doing. We were doing something called Mabo, which is more like um, uh, exchanging gifts between families. You know, you know, the one family will, will be giving gifts to the other family, which is which, which which is quite traditional as well, and celebrating that, and also doing it in our traditional regalia. While the constitution is one of the most liberal in the world, many South Africans are conservative. Nevertheless, there is some support in Sitole's hometown in the heart of Sudanland. Here in Chakaville is the first time we've seen anything like this and I think with this it will make it easier for others to come out because there are a lot of gay people here but they are afraid. We've accepted it here in our community. We have no problem. This always happens far from us and now we get to see it ourselves. We are curious to see how it will all happen. But other scholars of traditional African culture are less forgiving. Well, to answer the question whether are they married or not, it's very difficult because I don't know whether is it a groom and a bride or a groom and a groom. That is the problem. Now, we have never had of such a thing in our country, in our tradition. Now, to say they are married, we have never seen a man marry another man. And also, this is not a new procedure. And also the ancestors, I don't think that they will accept such a thing. I think it's the whole notion is to, is, is to question the idea that being gay is an African, especially, especially since we're in Africa. Um, gays have been living amongst us since time immemorial, even in the rural areas and also in the townships as well. We've always had gay people living as part of the community. I think now we, we're so blessed in South Africa that our constitution actually allows us to be uh, our marriages to be recognized as same-sex marriage. The happy couple says, regardless what critics say, it's about celebrating their sexuality as proud African men. in Northern Kuzunatal. ceremony between Chepo Morisani and Toba Sitoli, the video of which you've just seen a part, it carries on, it shows the ceremony, it shows a number of ritual engagements with what it means to be married and to be Zulu. It was uploaded onto YouTube by E! News and it was viewed in the couple of days some 400,000 times and the figure has since risen and several re-edited versions of the same material have been posted. The Daily Maverick, a popular e-news vehicle in South Africa, ran an article entitled, My Big Fat Gay Zulu Wedding, in which the journalist, Mandy Deval, um, writes, in the town where one of Africa's greatest warriors and military strategists was laid to rest, two courageous young men are redefining what traditional masculinity is all about. In Quad Buddha, where a memorial of Shaka stands proud, Chepo Morisani and Toba Setole became the first gay men in the province to celebrate their nuptials with a traditional rural marriage on September, on Saturday, 6th of April, 2013. Excuse me. And invited the town to come and celebrate with them. The pair say they were overwhelmed by the love and affection shown to them by the crowd. Sitole is given a lot, of, a lot of space in the news report. He speaks about how important it is to normalize gay marriages and to talk about the fact that they are just two guys in love. Now, the <coughs> journalism pieces and the commentary options offered by YouTube attracted both effusive notes of celebration and, and, of course, the predictable protestations about perversion and blasphemy. And the Modisani Sitoles set up a blog site <coughs> on which to post ongoing testimony to their mutual love and their desire to live in harmony with their ancestors and their families. I haven't met either Chapo Malisani or Toba Sitole in person. However, their story 
and its, on the whole, delighted circulation four months ago, crystallized for me a commitment to a deeper, more conscious, more accountable engagement with what I want to argue has become one of the most profound challenges to theorization on the politics of gender and sexuality since the last 20th century HIV panics. The notion that same-sex marriage is a right. The attendant construction of same-sex desire as, to quote Butler, the desire for the state's desire, and the facilitation of the homosexual subject as exchangeable with any other subject and mobile within the terms of the nation-state's legitimation of partnership. I'm far from the first to explore these challenges, and my interest in doing so has less to do with the hope that I can fertilize really new debates than with two other hopes. Firstly, that my exploration here this morning can galvanize conversations amongst us which go beyond the by now familiar dichotomizations, same-sex marriage as a liberal move versus same-sex marriage as a key and courageous achievement of human rights defenders. And secondly, and this is the one that bothers me more, were I to meet Chair Paul and Toba, I fear, I fear deeply that I would love them. I would love their expression of their interest in one another's lives. I would most certainly brandish my own spear in the face of anyone who attacked them or the legitimacy of their marriage. In a country marked by 60% unemployment among young black men of Chepo and Toba's age, where homophobia remains viciously live, and where dominant images of black masculinity remain fueled by the HIV development discourses homogenizing their violence, their risky sexual predilections, and their general irresponsibility. The Modisane Sutoles ask me to account for myself. <coughs> Should anyone propose to me, what do I think of what I may say? In his inaugural lecture in 1970, at the College of France, Foucault opens lightly with a dance between desire and the institution. I think a good many people, he said, he said it in beautiful French, I think a good many people have a desire to be freed from the obligation to begin. A similar desire to be on the other side of discourse from the outset without having to consider what might be strange, frightening, and perhaps maleficient about it. To this very common wish, the institution's reply is ironic since it solemnizes beginnings surrounds them with a circle of attention and silence and imposes ritualized forms on them as if to make them recognizable from a distance. Isn't that a lovely description of what might come to mind when we imagine marriage as an institution solemnizing beginnings, surrounding them with a circle of attention and silence? and imposing ritualized forms as if to make them, us, recognizable from a distance. It is, of course, also what we're up to in this room. The meaning of what we may accept as marriage is marketed most assuredly as a beginning and takes one of three places given by liberal accounts of being. Birth and death are the other two. These have come into formal authority as the measure of a documentable life, to the exclusion of so many other possibilities of transformation and mystery. It is in the nature of an institution, it cannot help it, to be carnivorous, 
It requires the repression of subjectivity and the substitution of automated embodiment, uniformed into notions of loyalty, service, and coded transactional relationships for its own survival, which is, of course, constantly under threat of displacement and fragmentation, also a Foucauldian point. It is thus, with Foucault's suggestion that the conversation between desire and the institution performs anxiety, a feeling that beneath the invitation to speak there are powers and dangers that are difficult to imagine, that's Foucault, that I begin. All that was a prologue. <laughs> there are two sections to the presentation, the range of issues through which it was possible for me to imagine exploration with you in terms of these words, education, religion, <laughs> institutions, was vast. I've chosen to focus on the meaning of marriage because I think it takes us into the heart of what we may want to discuss about the meaning of institutionalization and the politics of sexuality and scholarship. And there are two sections in this paper. The first is a review of some of the theoretical positions catalyzed by consideration of the legalization and same-sex marriage in the USA. You might want to ask me in the discussion section why I have chosen to start there. Um, I have some answers for you, but I have chosen, so bear with me. And that will move into, with a bit of a bridge, into an exploration of the interpolation of the debate on marriage within the emergence of South Africa's neoliberalization. The section that I'm about to start with is by no means intended to be comprehensive and some of the material is likely to be familiar. It's seeking to flag the very broad terrain of theoretical interests catalyzed by the recent considerations, and by recent I mean the last six, seven years, of legalizing same-sex marriage in the US. Its aim is to unpack, and very briefly, the density of US-based debates about same-sex marriage, which I want to put into juxtaposition with the notion that the most important way of understanding these debates is as merely imperializing. And the second section will place me more comfortably within my own terrain. My hunch is that the meaning of same-sex marriage needs to be explored, certainly for African context, but perhaps globally, as contextually embedded into critical conversations about what is permitted under what Butler refers to as intelligibility, the possibility of being not a citizen. I'm, I'm very tired of discussions about being a citizen, but being human, being gendered. And I move towards the possibility of talking about the possible politics of same-sex marriage within my own context, not as in correspondence with the West, but as one facet for a titanic struggle for new forms of gender and sexual embodiment in which the lure of marriage operates simply as one more bauble within the almost squandered borders of the nation-state. Section one. Catherine Frank, a um, professor associated with the Columbia Law School, wrote in 2006 that she regretted very deeply the ways in which um, the debate around the US advocacy of same-sex marriage led her to a disquiet, led her to mourning the loss of engagement with rich possibilities of lawlessness in the interests of overwhelming investment in the politics of kinship. But two years later, the pressure of same-sex advocacy had shifted Catherine Frank. She's saying this um, in the paper, if you would like to see it, I have the full references. She's lost her cry for the meaning of lawlessness and is scrabbling for something else 
she talks about efforts to secure marriage equality for same-sex couples must be undertaken at a minimum in a way that is compatible with efforts to dislodge marriage from its superior status. The move, while fully conscious that advocates on behalf of the cause of same-sex marriage have played a role in reinforcing the benchmark marriage sta status marriage enjoys, is one embraced by other theorists. Franzel, for example, suggests that marriage systems inhabited by lesbian, lesbians and gay people may well contribute to queer citizenship, and leading proponents of same-sex marriage throughout the recently fast-paced complex series of diverse USA state negotiations with what has been termed by some as a movement, argue that access to marriage for lesbian and gay adults is a civil right, a logical possibility within a constitutional commitment to liberty and equality, and is likely to stabilize gay and lesbian partnerships, bring formal equality into their children's lives, and facilitate smooth the flow of pink dollars into the economy. Along a liberal continuum, same-sex marriage advocacy moves from claims about realizing the dream of Martin Luther King. It's interesting, the research and advocacy material frequently makes comparisons between prohibitions of interracial heteros heterosexual unions and prohibitions of gay and lesbian ones. So it moves from claims about realizing the dream of Martin Luther King to promises about strengthening the dignity of children raised in gay families. Of course, there are myriad voices who have also called out the meaning of same-sex marriage advocacy. I can refer you here to just a soup song of some of them. Um, Yasmin Nair's blog um, archives audio and text pieces critiquing the drive towards same-sex marriage as liberation. And she includes radio interviews with Dean Spade alongside Emma Goldman's 1911 piece on marriage and love. I have to quote Goldman. It's just too good not to quote. Sorry. Um, marriage is primarily an economic arrangement, 1911 an insurance pact that marriage is a failure none but the very stupid will deny. It is like that other paternal arrangement, capitalism. It robs man of his birthright, sorry, she did say man, and his, stunts his growth, poisons his body, keeps him in ignorance, in poverty and dependence, and then institutes charities that thrive on the last vestige of a man's self-respect. Goldman is particularly, we will remember, scathing about the damage done by marriage to women under the politics of gender and class, and essentially later, analysts such as Polikoff, Hollenbach, Ekelbrecht, and others revitalize her arguments in their own skepticism about the meaning of lesbian and gay activism, which prioritize the reform of marriage laws. Now, a seven-minute review of this, it's a dense, multivocal, and multidisciplinary literature, doesn't actually do much that much justice to the density of the intellectual engagement at play. But there would, I think, be three themes one could note in terms of how this literature organizes a response to same-sex advocacy, oh, same-sex marriage advocacy. One, a really a beautiful article by Grossman, Fear and Loathing in Massachusetts, takes and uh, exemplifies this explores the long history within the United States of the fact that marriage is continually a process under simultaneous erasure and reclamation, one fueled by reluctant shifts of investment in the control of material and embodied resources. Um, this is a history which looks at a ferocious legal history around questions of consanguinity, race, mental health, venereal disease, religious affiliation. The idea that marriage is, has any kind of stable identity as a status is exemplified in this legal theme of discussion. A second theme in, is driven by writers who strongly identify as queer and frequently draw on analyses of race and class as central to the project of counter-heteronormativity. 
And despite differences between writers such as Spade, Jackie Alexander, Jaskier Poon, the obliteration of transgender justice, the meaning of border zones, and the marginalization of poor, rurally based Americans like the coal miners, and the normalization of the war on terror form interstitial frameworks for their critique of same-sex marriage advocacy. And a third theme kind of extends the second and is shaped through the debates on pinkwashing and homo-nationalism. A conference at CLAGS in April this year drew together a range of activist scholars arguing that Israel's efforts to market itself as a gay-friendly nation both mask and depend upon the erasure of that nation-state's brutal anti-Palestinian policies and upon the silencing of queer Palestinians. Shulman's position, um, which she was a conference organizer, concerns the need to work on the increasingly pressing phenomena of nationalist apparatus using the idea of gay rights to enforce racial supremacy, usually against Muslims. And this position has been explored by Poir, Grayson, and several others, and sees same-sex marriage advocacy of one thread as one thread of a dangerously conservative military and economic agenda. Gays in the army, same-sex marriage, modern families, and dramatically high-flying transgender models, they all cohere for this theme and a hegemonic discourse on the fabulous stretchiness of Norma, whose interests are primarily neo-capitalist and terrifyingly elitist. Now, all three themes are populated by fierce debate, fascinating voices. From the perspective of someone whose work is primarily generated in intensive conversation with Africa, and by African, I mean for the moment here simply continental, geographically far away, writers and activists who take their politics of gender and sexuality seriously. Some of the blind spots and siloizations within their choreographies, within these debates, are very striking. Take, for example, the fact that at the very same moment in which radical queer scholars in the States articulate enraged harmony around Israeli pinkwashing, they seem completely unaware that the term is already in circulation through debates on the corporate uptake of breast cancer advocacy. This is the work of Yanora Tifa, a long-term radical feminist whose focus on reproductive justice has pioneered theory on the links between new reproductive technologies, capital, and women's bodies. And she writes, pink washing campaigns in which women are encouraged to wear ribbons attached to body loving and costly fragrances seek to disguise the strong linkages between corporate interests and strongly conservative lobbies which seek to curtail women's reproductive choices. Pink split between queer activism and radical feminists. Not good, but very interesting. And not a new tension. Pink is always a good color. But to imagine that there are no linkages between the cynicism of corporate media campaigns against breast cancer and notions of the war on terror, that's, that's a bit naive. And here's another one. Interesting slippage. Those arguing, this is from my perspective. Remember, I'm not from the US. I'm reading it in texts. I do know some of the writers, but I'm not an insider. I may very well be misreading the dynamics. This is just from an outsider. But another one. Those arguing, usually within the law, for complex and contextualized readings of marriage as intimately and fractiously embedded with other legal processes and identities, rarely acknowledge that these long and deep-seated wrangles concern not simply debate on the shape of citizenship, but simultaneously assume citizenship as a good. In 2013, and 50 years of emerging, failing, and reforming 
nations, do we have to go back as far as Virginia Woolf to remember that citizenship for people gendered as women, for subalterneity, constitutes a dense zone of surveillance, embodied capture, and political economic exploitation. Under what conditions can we ever accept the good of citizenship, except as a back against the wall position in fighting to end, for example, attacks against migrant laborers, refugees, and even those of us who have used this ocean to de notion to demand shifts in oppressive legal systems or attention to systematic state brutalities have found any gains short-lived. By very definition, the project of citizenship is an exclusive one, always dangerous, and as Matutlak has said, of nations, always gendered. How am I doing on time? I think I, I think I will. I think I will. I do have I do have more to to say about about some of the gaps in in this literature. Um, but I want to move to to my own context, and I, I want to do so through a particular personal moment. This, these are the discourses which certainly flow among all of us, and there I was in June this year, um, when President Obama, carrying many discourses as well as debates around China and trade and development in his briefcase, he visited Africa, ostensibly, oh, no, no. <laughs> ostensibly in fulfillment of a promise made earlier and more likely in pursuit of stronger commitments from African presidents that trade agreements with China would be negotiated only in certain terms favorable to U.S. interests. His arrival in Dakar, I was there, Senegal, on June, in June, was presaged by a street cleaning of several city areas where hundreds of local street traders and so-called beggars were forcibly removed. Of course, such removals also affected sex workers the routes of city buses and taxes, and entrance into large commercial markets. It was also presaged as a highly significant diplomatic occasion, especially as Dakar had been chosen as the portal to Africa. In a televised <coughs> and widely watched encounter between Senegalese President Macky Sall and Barack Obama, Obama suggested that Senegal, if I had time, I would show you this YouTube. It's wild. Um, it's also in French. Um, suggested that Senegal should understand the rights of lesbians and gay people as human rights. To which, Aki Sal responded that different contexts responded differently to the notion of rights. He said in French, we abolished the death penalty some time ago. I want to show you something. Here are the newspapers from the next day. The headline says, Obama, Obama play pour les hommes. Marquis dit no. Obama please. For the homos, Maki says no. <laughs> there are several of these. And um, the daily papers and the radio shows were collectively jubilant. And throughout the day, pride in Maki's rebuff to Obama poured in. Now that morning, I was working at Kadesria in Dakar. As, as a director of the annual residential seminar for young faculty and researchers and that, that year, this year, and the focus of the seminar was on sexualities. And the three weeks of work sought to cover questions of historiography, the impact of development discourses, the meanings of sexuality research, many things, the power of technologies in constructing desire and pleasure, 
And given multilingualism and diverse research interests, running the seminar it was not an altogether straightforward business. I had some fantastic colleagues, Sheikh Mian, Babere Chacha, Amina Ek Okesh, and sessions on the politics of counter-heteronormativities and their deep histories within diverse contexts had been slow and tense as we found our way towards one another. While Sheikh Mian, who has worked with questions of stigmatization, sex work and homosexualities in Dakar, had successfully encouraged seminar participants to set aside their mistrust of Western paradigms, the morning celebration of President Maki was infectious. Scorn was heaped on Obama for bringing finger-wagging about homosexuals and marriage. Actually, he didn't actually say anything about same-sex marriage, but same-sex marriage became very quickly interpolated in what he was thought to have said. Um, and it was not possible to return to Professor Nyan's trajectory, one that was intended to allow discussion of contemporary counter-heteronormativity to develop from a sense of participants contextually and linguistically specific questions rather than from the need to connect homosexuality and trans living to rights agendas. Although the meaning of having lesbian and gay in your passport as the implication of being married is not at the forefront of debate in the US, the mobility of US plus gay plus bully, someone to be stopped at the door and reminded about the meaning of humanity, we have abolished the death penalty, is in this story dramatic. In a series of workshops offered by Carl Sutherland, currently associated with the Columbia School of Law, she outlines a broad framework for understanding the global context in which notions of homosexual equality can be fought for as rights. And her presentation stressed two issues. Firstly, that bodies as powerful as the OIC, the Papal See, and the Russian bloc are very unlikely to separate American-affiliated calls for the connection between homosexual rights and political freedom from American-affiliated drones. And secondly, while advocacy for same-sex marriage in the U.S. emerges from a very long and deeply unfinished narrative of queer, counter-racist, and feminist struggle. In many of the contexts in which the West is mistakenly read as gay-friendly, decriminalization is not a legal option. And yet it is around questions of getting married that lesbian and gay people are subjected, in many of the contexts in which I work, to recriminalization and environments of dangerously deepened hostility As many scholars, that was the bridge. Now we're in section two and it's shorter. As many scholars and activists have discussed, the politics of gender and sexuality in South Africa have always been connected to the meaning of the state and there's a great deal of scholarship on this, including by some incredibly intelligent and interesting people in the room. Since 1994, however, a number of very interesting debates about sexual right, rights have emerged and access to marriage has been argued to be one of the most powerfully constructed contractual relationships in terms of rights to citizenship. But now think about it. 1994, okay, this is a map of pre-1994 South Africa. The formation of the new nation state emerging out of apartheid structures faced a number of quantum-shaped dilemmas. Overnight, the country had formally moved from an official population of some 4.5 million to one of 44 million. How did that work? Well, we all know the story that the grey in this map constitutes the apartheid version of the legitimate state, 
87% of the land colonized much earlier, of course, than apartheid's regime, but deepened during it. The little colored bits constitute what were known as homelands or Bantustans, to which the majority of the, po of the population were consigned as formal citizens. Um, the 44 million certainly were dragged into the gray space under many of the conditions of labor laws, but they were not considered as part and parcel of the South African state's citizenry. So South Africa then comprised some 87% of the land. The 13 was divided into another 83 parcels of land, under, and those parcels were originated under puppet apartheid appointment governments and held as the legal homelands. Now, there's a lot to say about that, but one of the most important things that happened was that in 1994, not only with the news was the new state faced with the overwhelming challenge of reimagining health systems, schooling, and higher education, the need to redesign all social grants and pension policies. So that a people, once 4.5 million, now could recognize 44 million needs in a place There was also the not so small matter that only a tiny proportion of the new South Africans were legally married. The vast majority of married couples had been, for decades and decades and decades, recognized as such only in inverted commas, under customary law, solemnized for centuries under local traditional leadership and family practice, and very rarely registered with the apartheid state. There's a very long story of the embeddedness of colonialism with the meaning of what is now called customary law. I don't want to go into that. I simply want to no, yeah. Um, um, I simply want to point to the fact that at the emergence of rainbow liberation, the question of the meaning of marriage formed a central dilemma for the possibility of South Africanness. And in 2013, any discussion of what marriage means would need to take on board the plurilegal and multicultural debates around what constitutes a marriage and what simultaneously can be known of the ways in which options to enter and leave marriages offer resources within economies of survival which render embodied sexuality a dynamic marketplace. And for the past two decades, South Africans have been engaged in complex contestations about what constitutes valid access to heteronormativities. And there are very fierce battles being fought about contesting legitimacies. The struggle for lesbian and gay people's access to marriage is being waged within a terrain in which marriage itself is under debate. There is no consensus on what constitutes the limits of acceptable violence here, nor no meaning, nor upon the meaning of equal rights. I want to talk a little bit about customary marriages. Um, they are the most common form of marriage in the country, solemnized in relation to local precedent of ritual and family-rooted expectations about what marriage and marriageability <coughs> entail. And De Proposal um, writes that between 1910 and 1970, the government shied away, the apartheid government, from any uniform attempt to codify such marriages. And the implications of this on millions of couples' negotiations for housing, access to employment, and on their children's standing. Um, in several million South Africans remain without birth registration, a precondition for, in 2013 for medical and educational access. In 1998, legal reform sought to recognize that customary marriages entitled participants to state <coughs> protection, but it entailed not only the retrospective registration of millions of partnerships, but simultaneously the legitimation of polygamy and new sets of expectations around taxation, pension laws, and employment benefits. In this particular
particular case, the first wife of a man which was just decided by the Constitutional Court a couple of months ago, the first wife of a man who died, left the house that he lived in in his cattle to his second wife. The court agreed that the second wife, um, despite its registration, wasn't valid because the first wife hadn't given permission for it. And this judgment was hailed in some quarters as recognizing the first wife's right to dignity. But as Chuma Himonga points out, the desire to grant the first wife dignity as a married woman both erases the second wife's relationship to the man and disappears him as a legally salient entity. That example is one of thousands heard in different courts, both traditional and civil, since 1997, suggests that what is at stake in the idea of redistributive justice, the possibility that what is right cannot be determined by who gains what, but by what has died last year. A small NGO called the One in Nine Project interrupt the flow of paraders, mostly white, mostly men, very exuberant about the meaning of having a gay pride, and very much in celebration of the notion of rights and their right to, to marry. There's, quite, there's some research emerging on the meaning of the Civil Union Act for couples in South Africa. I would like to be able to tell you some of its findings. They are not altogether easy to hear and certainly don't suggest that the Act has transformed the discrimination they face in their lives. But in this particular video clip, what you would witness is last year's interruption of a gay pride parade by the One in Nine project seeking to address the grounds on which embodiment as a marginal citizen, black, women, poor, demand a rethinking of the meaning of celebration. What you would see is a row of one in nine activists stretched across the road in purple t-shirts meeting the march. The march is coming down the street. There are banners, there are rainbows, there are we are happily married couples, da 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 da. And then they're blocked by this row of activists who lie down. <laughs> they lie down. The march walks over them. March walks over them. It's a devastating clip, and because I have one minute, it would it would give you a visual image of the meaning of the wrestle for embodiment. And as far as fast as South African, I have three paragraphs, and I am going to read them. As fast as South African institutions, legal, educational, religious, linguistic, wrestle to expand access to marriage, so hundreds and thousands of people struggle to leave marriages, obtain orders of protection from abusive domestic partners, desperately trying to access the maintenance funds legally granted to them by divorced or absent partners, struggle in local courts to manage issues of child custody, and choose homelessness in preference to life with their husband. At the Saki Bartman Center for Abused Women and Children, a one-stop center for women in Manenburg, one of the poorer neighborhoods in Cape Town, and worked there for quite a while. Funds are becoming hard to find, and each day this year, 18 women and their small children have been turned away as they come hoping to find a space in the center shelter. They're all trying to escape marriages. A few kilometers away in a different suburb, young and older men sit unemployed, filling their days with small attempts to raise money and develop friendships with men, with women. Their chances of economic devastation are higher, and along with this, the hope of formalization of any marriage hopes they cannot pay, lobola, which is expected under customary practice. Reading the institution of marriage within the minute period in which the new South Africa has been inserted into the current global order 
is to witness a painful, chaotic and dense breathing process. Marriage as the lungs of the new nation body. Expand. Register millions. Reinvent systems. Align with constitutional values. Breathe in. More and more pouring in under different conditions, understandings, rituals, intercommunications. Contract. Breathe out. Battered women. Poor women. Poor and hurt women. Men without incomes. Women fighting for custody, inheritance, gender identity change. People trying to get away from their partner's debts, their ex-wives' needs. Millions more streaming and crawling away. It's exhausting. And seductive. And seductive. The intricate micro-political dances of those breaths. Get marriage. Leave marriage. Seem to me to suggest that we have a relationship to the ter determination of our independence under the nation state that we surely do not. There is no there there. While there may indeed be laws around the possibility of same-sex marriage, the marriage space, too porous, creaky, fragile, misunderstood, feared and idealized to function as institution, is simply one in which critical races for any kind of humanity get played out. Despite the traditionally English phrase about the meaning of life, hatched, matched and dispatched, those who engage with marriages find themselves not matched, but tossed into such a whirlwind of micro-political dispersal that hardly a man or a woman survives with any strong sense of what their lives might mean outside marriage's remit. It is in many ways the most powerful form of social feminization. It turns us all, men, women, trans, queer, into women subject to the laws of an unseen linguistic and legal majesty, our salience service, our significance ritualized into being a part of, and to the longings of emotional landscapes threaded by an endlessly deferred desire. Uh, you have uh, beautifully and laboriously 
succeeded in dismantling one of the most solemnized and ritualized state institutions, which is marriage. Focusing here on same-sex marriage, as an agency, marriage I mean, of imperialism in the uh, neoliberal era. And that was done in a way that went beyond the uh, uh, currently familiar uh, dichotization uh, like liberal move versus the uh, rights move or movements. The interface you alluded to of desire, institution, and controversies and blind spots and this tempestuous relation was eloquently delineated going to the core of a restless, never tiring discourse of hegemony, uh, meaning in this case the practice, the old time practice of hegemony uh, by, uh, uh, I mean, in the historical agencies that we all know of. This is dramatically expressed in birth and death, serving the cause, serving the ideology of the carnivorous institutions, a proof of loyalty and service. And here, allow me to uh, give an example from where I come from, from the Middle East where the uh, uh, oppressed Palestinian population will uh, think of their fertility as a population bomb versus, for example, the nuclear bomb uh, 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 of the uh, Israeli government. Another example is from the Algerian revolution, where mothers were considered to be a major part of this revolution because they are the mothers of the marriages. And their main role was to procreate and have more kids uh, uh, in fighting uh, the uh, French uh, colonization at that time. It is this institutional use of marriage to serve the double and the multiple personalities of governments and of the imperial goals of the states. On one hand, marriage being controlling and being economic and political institutions, but on the other hand, is a dynamic and ever-changing social structure. From where I come, as I said, from Lebanon and the troubled Middle East, where war vessels now, as I speak, are filling the Middle East, the Mediterranean Sea, of course not having tango dances, but waiting to uh, uh, bomb Syria and discipline the regimes in that region. Most of these governments in the Middle East did not sign the 1994 ICPD uh, right and uh, the reproductive and sexual rights declarations. In these uh, 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 countries, we talk about four or five types of marriages. If the guy, if the man is going to the family to ask to marry the, the daughter in the, uh, in the family, uh, uh, people think of one type of marriage, the traditional marriage. But in this case, you have five types of marriages. You have the traditional marriage, you have the customary marriage or the Arfi marriage, you have the temporary marriage, you have the Nisiar marriage, and you have the summer marriage. And all these types of marriages, they are solely based on economic arrangements and at times on pleasure, also satisfaction for the males. And in all this, they claim to protect the children as a main outcome of this marriage as you have alluded to in one of your themes in the section one of the presentation. Here, interpretation used to, or claims, to protect women and men from adultery and its consequences. This is the justification for these types of marriages, which can be fairly compared to the use of homo-nationalism or pinkwashing to identify with the Western culture, yet show racial supremacy against Muslims, as you have quoted, while at the same time committing brutal measures and acts against Palestinians, in the case of the uh, Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and adhering to a one-state solution, which is a Jewish state, and what kind of relevance left to the notion of human right in this regard for the people living in that part of the world. Yet, you have also beautifully applied pinkwashing and reproductive justice. Whereas we speak of reproductive rights, we adopt or portray a protectionist and the harm reduction approach. Examples like assisted biotechnology, where main, most of the, of the medical interventions are done on the female part, the family planning that you are all aware of, and most obviously 
cancer campaigns and the female sexual disorders. When it comes to the pharma and the interest of the pharma, the complaints of the female sexuality are disorders and need to be treated. When it comes to the religious institutions and to the man in the house or in the family, these complaints are just expected because of the female, you have been uh, uh, giving birth, uh, you've been growing older, and so on and so forth. Uh, and this is also where people, as you said, uh, gendered as women in this case, and that constitutes a dense zone of surveillance, embodied capture, and political exploitation. For a second, people forget the random killing and death in Syria, and they are amazed by a fatwa. You all know what's a fatwa. Fatwa is a religious uh, interpretation. Allowing female, female sex affairs. And that has been very shameful, according to uh, the people there. When men are busy fighting, so females are allowed to have sex with females to fulfill their needs. And this is coming after another fatwa, allowing females to provide sex for the mujahideen, for the fighters, many ways, multiple ways, anytime they want, in order to ensure good fighting. Yeah, they have to be relaxed. <laughs> kill, and, kill. and the whole business is a flourishing around this. You see, for a moment, the religious people are forgetting about the meaning of marriage and they're using this institution now with a new thing called Nikah uh, al-Jihad. Uh, that is, during the times of war and fighting, the females are supposed to sexually satisfy these mujahideen and these fighters. And not only this. Thousands and thousands of cases of young girls, aged now 13, 12, and 14, Syrian girls, are being married to much older uh, 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 people or rich people, and for the sake of protecting those young girls from uh, 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 shameful uh, outcomes or adultery or other things. I want also to thank you for the quote, it's all in my passport, at a time where marriage remains the most prevalent globally because it's economic, uh, it's cost effective, because there is a, a, a social uh, legitimacy, and also because it, uh, there is a religious affiliation with being married. But we have, it happens with me and many times, I have to speak to the general security in, in, in Lebanon, to the director of the security, so they don't mention the right, the word divorced, on the passport of women who are divorced. Because on your passport, if you have the word divorce, that will put you uh, in a very embarrassing and awkward situation, whether you are uh, crossing borders, whether you are dealing with your formal paperwork in the government and in the public administration, and so on and so forth. Lastly, it tempts me to say that pink washing or human rights washing, I don't know if that's true or not, I can use this, and all types of washing. Uh, 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 to launch and engage in the war in terror that we uh, uh, witness and live every day, uh, used by the U.S. administration, uh, uh, so much killing in the region, as you all know, with daily uh, 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 killing by the drones in Yemen every day. Uh, at the same time, there is strong alliance with the Gulf states where none of the issue of the human rights is, is, even, is even brought to discussion or to any uh, of these tables. And Lastly, the strong alliance uh, uh, with the uh, uh, Muslim Brotherhood in the region, uh, which reminded me yeah, of the talk of Professor Hirsch yesterday, and the similarity between this new evangelical approach to controlling people and the Muslim Brotherhood approach, because those people believe they have a contract with God, and they know exactly uh, what uh, uh, everyone uh, of us needs, and they can take, uh, they can take care of us. Uh, okay, uh, at the end of this, uh, I have several questions now, because you left me with more questions than... Uh, uh, and my question is, if you are questioning the uh, issue of citizenship, and you are questioning the whole institution of, of marriage, then how can you explain 
this whole, uh, I don't know, need or this urge for individuals or for humans to affiliate in some kind of an institution or an agency and what makes us uh, like go into being religious or being in a certain political party or having a passport or having an ID or belonging to uh, some kind of uh, a geographical uh, space or a political uh, space and uh, the end I uh, have to uh, remind ourselves of the famous slogan the personal uh, is political, the famous feminist slogan and the link between the, uh, uh, the sexual and the power dynamics and also in the hope uh, for a change for a better world. Thank you very much. comments and we all share your hope for a better world. Um, we are now moving to our uh, second discussion, Gloria Chariaka. Uh, I've known Gloria for a very long time, she's a very strong activist. Uh, she's at the moment, uh, has been for a long time, professor at the uh, uh, National University in uh, Mexico, Mexico City, you know. uh, but she's also the uh, general, Secretary General of ILGA. And in that sense, she's with the forefront of international advocacy of um, GLBTIQ, etc., etc., etc. Thank you, Gloria. Gloria. Gloria will speak in Spanish. Buenos días. Bueno, primero, muchas gracias por la oportunidad de, de participar en esta discusión. Y gracias, Jane, por por levantar la polémica alrededor de esta lucha que alrededor de todo el mundo se está dando. Creo que, sin duda, eh, la lucha por el matrimonio igualitario es una lucha que causa mucha polémica y que, como ya se ha dicho, impulsa una gran polémica no solamente entre las posiciones conservadoras y y progresistas, sino al interior de cada una de estas también. Y en ese sentido me parece que es un debate que prácticamente se está iniciando en términos de, de conquista social, a pesar de que tal vez tendríamos que recordar de dónde es que surge esta necesidad de la lucha por el matrimonio igualitario dentro del movimiento LGBTI. Me parece que las primeras demandas claras organizadas con respecto a la demanda del matrimonio igualitario se dieron precisamente en el contexto de la epidemia del VIH. Como muchas de las luchas que enfrentamos, surge precisamente de las violaciones que muchos hombres gays sufrieron a partir de no tener eh, la garantía económica una vez que su pareja moría. Pero no solamente eso, eh, había mucho interés o había mucho dolor en cuanto a la separación, la, incluso algunos decían el secuestro de las parejas que muchas veces impedían que la pareja se mantuviera junta durante el, durante el proceso de la enfermedad. Y creo que, que, es, eh, que es esta condición precisamente de despojo el despojo de la población, el despojo de los bienes, que levanta el debate con respecto a la necesidad del reconocimiento de la pareja. Esta, esta demanda, sin, du sin duda, se tomó una distancia durante mucho tiempo que, que probablemente, precisamente con, el, con la transición que la epidemia del VIH SIDA ha tenido, pareciera que dejó de ser interés de este grupo específico de seguir luchando por el matrimonio. Sin embargo, eh, en los últimos tiempos ha aparecido de una manera estrepitosa que llama mucho la atención para, para todas las personas. Efectivamente, se ha hecho una analogía con respecto a la lucha del matrimonio igualitario con respecto a la lucha del matrimonio interracial. Pero me parece que la... La propuesta en la que está fundada una y otra lucha tienen divergencias muy importantes que, que las hacen distintas, muy difícil de mantener esa analogía. Por una parte, tanto el movimiento feminista como el movimiento LGBTI se pronunciaron 
desde los años 70 por la libertad sexual, en contra de la heteronormatividad y una serie de principios que apostaban a la construcción de una nueva forma de relacionamiento, de una nueva estructura social. Esto pareciera que empieza a tambalearse ahora con la propuesta del matrimonio igualitario. Creo que el, el matrimonio igualitario para algunas personas hoy es producto de la necesidad del reconocimiento de la pareja, pero un reconocimiento que tiene que ver en, en, en muchas ocasiones, o que ha tenido que ver en muchas ocasiones, con la incapacidad de los estados de cumplir con la protección de los derechos individuales, que muchas parejas sienten que no hay la posibilidad de tener acceso a los beneficios que la sociedad otorga a la ciudadanía en su conjunto. Esto podría ser una justificación importante para la lucha que hoy se está dando. Y, y mucho creo que quienes nos hemos involucrado en, en la lucha por la, por la conquista del matrimonio igualitario ha sido el fundamento principal que, que ha guiado el trabajo. Sin embargo, los resultados que hemos ido viendo en, a, ante la conquista de este... Que quiero decir también que esta conquista del matrimonio igualitario abarca apenas 15 países en el mundo. No es algo que... Aunque es un debate universal, aunque es un debate que nos ha involucrado a todos, apenas 15 países, que no es nada, ¿no? son los que han otorgado este derecho. También hay que decir que este derecho está sustentado también en la Declaración Universal de 1948, el matrimonio para todas las personas. ¿no? Entonces, ahí hay varias, por eso digo que es un asunto polémico que, que, que exige mayor análisis. ¿no? Decía yo que estaba fundado principalmente en la protección de los derechos, en la incapacidad de la protección de los derechos individuales, pero también tendríamos que ver qué pasa con el matrimonio hoy. Por una parte, como ya se señaló, el significado del matrimonio tiene distintos sentidos dependiendo de las distintas culturas. Tiene distintas expresiones y configuración en los distintos espacios culturales también. Y aquí a mí me llama la atención la apuesta a una sola forma de matrimonio, una sola forma de matrimonio. De hecho, y quiero, como paréntesis, quiero comentar, bueno, aquí en, en Argentina la propuesta de pacto social fue casi vetada con respecto a la conquista del matrimonio igualitario. ¿no? Había una propuesta que se llamaba pacto social y que se desechó para, para buscar el matrimonio pensando que lo que buscaban era ser igualititos. Igual, en, en México recientemente nos convocaron a una reunión para que lucháramos porque en uno de los estados se consiguió también un pacto social, un, un pacto social en uno de los estados que otorga los derechos, pero que no se llama matrimonio. Entonces había que luchar ahora porque le cambiaran la palabra matrimonio. Entonces ahí es donde yo digo, bueno, creo que nos estamos confundiendo de qué es, qué es por lo que estamos luchando. ¿no? Por otra parte, me parece que... Eh, que necesariamente, como se ha señalado ya, el, el matrimonio, el deseo del matrimonio tiene intereses económicos, tiene intereses sociales también. Para mí me interesaría ver, bueno, dentro de esta búsqueda de la construcción de las familias homoparentales, ¿qué es lo que se está buscando? ¿Se está buscando la normativización? Porque no es extraño también el en los países en donde se ha, se ha conquistado este matrimonio, cuál ha sido la ruta que ha seguido en las, en la, en las asambleas legislativas o en los congresos de diputados. Me parece que este proceso de normativización es uno de los que más nos alertan. A mí incluso me da la impresión de que hay muchas personas dentro del, del mundo LGBTI que, que necesitan un reconocimiento que yo llamo de adesentamiento. Queremos ser reconocidos como personas decentes. ¿no? Personas decentes, monogámicas, estables. O sea, quitar estas ideas estereotipadas que hay de que el mundo LGBT o lesbianas y gays somos 
personas inmorales. Entonces me parece que ahí hay también una, un elemento muy importante que habría que considerar. No estoy calificando todavía. Y me, pero, pero tendríamos que estar conscientes de que, de que esta, esta aspiración dentro del matrimonio necesariamente nos lleva, en un, nos, nos somete en un modelo claramente de la, de la producción social del mantenimiento de una estructura contra la que supuestamente estábamos luchando. Pero también tendríamos que ver esta, este, este derecho al matrimonio, ¿quiénes son los que están accediendo a su ejercicio? Yo veo grandes artistas, es impresionante la cantidad de dinero que, que, que se está gastando en aquellos países en donde ya se legalizó el matrimonio igualitario, la cantidad de dinero que se está gastando en bodas suntuosas, en grandes hoteles, en salones de fiesta y lunas de miel, es una cosa realmente exagerada el gasto económico que esto está implicando para muchas familias y parejas involucradas en el ejercicio de este, el ejercicio de este derecho. Pero también tendríamos que ver ¿Quiénes son? Si están? A mí lo que me asombra es cuando activistas del movimiento entran también en este escenario de las dos cosas. Entonces, y también tendríamos que preguntarnos, bueno, ¿cómo es que la lucha o la conquista del matrimonio igualitario ha contribuido también en aquellos países en donde se ha conquistado a una desmovilización muy importante? Pareciera que una vez que fuimos aceptados dentro del matrimonio ya no hay más por qué luchar. Y esto me parece también uno de los riesgos importantes. Finalmente, quiero, quiero decir que eh, la política de los derechos LGBTI, y como ya hemos visto, el, la sexualidad en sí misma ha sido una moneda de intercambio entre los países. Como tú señalabas, esta, esta situación de hoy, de que los derechos LGBT se conviertan en una moneda de cambio para extorsionar y presionar a, a otros gobiernos, para decir que si no están apoyando los derechos LGBTI, entonces no van a recibir cooperación internacional o van a ser descalificados, como pasó anteriormente con otros, con otros elementos dentro de la salud sexual y reproductiva, precisamente. Pero la sexualidad ha sido, para mí, por lo menos en mi experiencia en la arena internacional, desde, los, desde la Conferencia de Derechos Humanos, la Conferencia de Población y Desarrollo en el Cairo, ha sido la sexualidad una moneda de cambio permanente. Eh, la, de, la desaparición de la propuesta, de la resolución de 2003 de Brasil, una vez que estableció el, el, el convenio con los países árabes, un convenio comercial con los países árabes, pues deja, deja ver claramente dónde está la sexualidad en, en la arena internacional. Y, y bueno, quiero que decir que... Y una, creo que no podemos perder de vista la necesidad del reconocimiento de la diversidad sociocultural de la sexualidad. Que ese es un desafío que tenemos que tener presente y que nuestras expresiones, de, de, incluso de cada una de nuestras identidades sexuales y de nuestras formas de relacionamiento, tienen un significado y un sentido específico en cada cultura que no debiéramos de perder. Y que tenemos desafíos muy pendientes en la lucha por los derechos humanos la pena de muerte, la criminalización de la condición LGBT en tantos países, las violaciones y terapias curativas, los valores tradicionales que se levantan en contra de nuestra condición y la discriminación estructural, el racismo, el sexismo y la homofobia tiene plena vigencia para poder seguir luchando en la construcción real de una profunda cultura universal de derechos humanos que me parece que ese es el desafío más importante que tenemos en frente. Gracias.
short in your question. Don't make long statements before you ask a question. Really come up with a question, right? <laughs> Dos preguntas. Primera, en Argentina cuando se discutió políticamente y públicamente el matrimonio igualitario apareció el amor como en el argumentario político. Eh, ya te quería preguntar qué rol tiene, si tiene alguno el amor en esa discusión. Y la segunda pregunta... Eh, no es respondible, pero esta crítica a la imposición imperialista norteamericana del respeto de las mujeres o de los LGBT y eh, la reacción, por ejemplo, del presidente de Senegal, eh, ¿es una razón o un pretexto? Es decir, porque venga del imperialismo no lo aceptamos o es la excusa que es usada para no aceptar. Hello, uh, my name is Rhonda Scott and um, I'm from Cape Town. I have quite a number of questions but I want to ask them all. Um, first of all, I'm actually very interested in why you chose to start and use kind of like the American kind of theorist and examples. Uh, and then you also mentioned something about, uh, which I find interesting, if you, had, if you would meet the wedding couple, uh, the Zulu wedding couple, you would actually uh, like them. I think that's uh, there's something there. And also, do you think that there's something uh, revolutionary about the Zulu wedding? Um, okay, I, I'll stop there. Okay. Thank you so much. And then there was one question there in the corner. Yes. Yes, yes, yes please. Yes. Um, one question for you, Jane, and for all. I was struck by your by how how tired you are of the citizenship mode. <laughs> so I was going to, to, to ask you and all the panel, especially from Gloria's comment, if marriage has so different meanings everywhere, and we need to think about that, what about the meaning of citizenship and the use of rights that I think is very much contestable, right? So what do you think about that? Okay, thank you so much. Uh, three rich questions. I'm first giving the floor to Jay, and then Faisal and Gloria will also answer, and then we close the session, and then I've got some announcements to make. Uh, Jay, please. to Gloria and to Faisal for, for your comments and to Saskia for your patience and to you for your patience with my, um, with my failure to, to be restricted in relation to time. It's, it's not respectful and it means that I have less, we have less of an opportunity to talk with one another. So, so the apology is not, it's not, it's not superficial and perhaps we can have further discussion after or during the tea break. To, I'm going to combine my response to Luando with my response to Mario because both of you are asking in relation to my position in relation to Tepo and Tabo. What I was trying to share with you is a <coughs> visceral epistemological dilemma. I am not saying this is revolutionary. I am not saying it is not revolutionary. I am saying I do not know what to say. <laughs> and I, I, that, is not a, that is not a facetious answer. What I bent your ears around, and I thank you, for your tolerance was to try to reach a relationship to my own visceral delight in, I mean, 
and saw the YouTube, like many so that there would have been people who, who would have participated at that wedding, who would know the actual people. For me, they were representations. But even, in a, although I have been at weddings, um, and I have felt a similar disquiet, it's amazing, there is love, everybody is delighted, there is dancing, you can drink as much as you like, you can be the most gendered, sexual, and race-free in sudden extraordinary moments that, yes, yes, no. <laughs> See, I don't know, Mario, I don't know. That's why I am starting with it. Mario, I don't know. I don't know what I will do if somebody asks me to marry her. I don't know. And that is ridiculous. <laughs> I am 55. I ought to know what I think. But this phenomenon requires a relationship to intellectual accountability I have not reached. When it comes to citizenship, yeah, my jury is not out. My jury is in. I have watched the ways in my own country and in many other African post-democratic sites in which the discourses of citizenship have been deployed in the name of a revolution for all that has turned out to simply reinforce economic instability and discrimination. I am skeptical. So what you definitely eloquently speaking out that you don't know how to speak. <laughs> so please, a, a short comment and a Claudia. What, what I can comment on is in relation to the uh, various types of marriages. And from where I stand, I believe that um, Marriage is a dynamic process and it's used like citizenship to serve the institution and to serve regimes and to serve states. Because if you look at, for example, the pre-Islamic era in the, in, the, in the Arab region, there was a polyandry. Polyandry was practiced there. See, then came uh, the, uh, the Islamic era and they stopped polyandry but they kept polygamy, for example. And that was because that practice was socially very flourishing around that time, and at the same time, it was part of controlling, as I said, homosexuality and the byproduct of, of marriage and stuff like this. It all goes back to what suits the states in their economic and in their political discourse over time, likewise citizenship. Yo creo que, yo creo que, que precisamente lo que yo mencionaba, que no terminé, es decir, ¿quiénes son quienes se están casando? ¿Quiénes están ejerciendo este derecho? Es una cantidad de impresionante de personas que no necesariamente son quienes están involucrados en el movimiento. ¿no? O sea, hay un ejercicio distinto. Yo cuestiono los que están en el movimiento y que pretenden modificar la estructura, que tengan también esas bodas sustosas. Pero... Efectivamente, ¿quiénes estamos involucrados en la transformación social? Un grupo de personas. Aquí la cuestión es, ¿cómo estas conquistas, qué, a qué es a lo que contribuyen? Porque entonces yo, yo pienso, si el matrimonio llega a estar enmarcado dentro de esta normativación, normativización social, entonces, ¿dónde quedan los derechos de, los, de la disidencia? ¿Cómo la disidencia accede a esos derechos si todos vamos entrando en el paquete normativo? ¿no? Y entonces, y tiene que ver con la pregunta de Mario también, entonces, ¿cuál es el amor y la sexualidad legítimos para la sociedad? ¿No? Al final, ahí está la pregunta. Bueno, profound questions. But two very uh, clear announcements. The first announcement is, you are all invited to the ICET business meeting which will be held at 1, at the Salon of Bungalow. Uh, and then you really have to wear your conference badge, and, and the, 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 the organizers also tell you to watch for your personal belongings. So apparently there's been a problem there. Thank you so much for your attention to this wonderful session.